Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 1. It came about at the end of 20 years in which Solomon had built the house of the Lord and his own house that he built the cities which Hiram, or Hiram, as First King calls, Kings calls him, that Hiram had given him and settled the sons of Israel there. A little background to where we are. 20 years have gone by since chapter 7. I told you, we, we move quickly in these Bible studies. And it's been 20 years since last week. And in these 20 years, the year is approximately 951 B.C., the chronicler gives us a chronology. He gives us in two verses a quick summation of the first 20 years of Solomon's reign. The primary things that Solomon accomplished in those 20 years. First, he built the temple. The first seven years of his reign was building the temple. Now, if you, if you count it by months, it's literally seven and a half years. But when the Bible talks about it, it just refers to it as a seven-year period of time. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 38 give us that. Seven years to build the temple, from groundbreaking to turnkey. The next 13 years of Solomon's reign, following that, he would spend building his palatial home there in Jerusalem. You can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 7. And then he also began, as we see here, and we will see throughout the rest of chapter 8 tonight, he began to fortify key strategic positions throughout Israel. The Israelis in modern Israel have figured out how key that is to have fortified positions throughout the country. In fact, when the Jewish people first came into the land after 1948, when they declared independence, there were key positions. The kibbutzes placed all over Israel were not just farming communities. They were not just about trying to reclaim the land and roll back the swamps. The kibbutz system was also a system of defense against the surrounding Arab nations that were impinging and imposing and seeking to drive them into the sea. And so many of these, many of these days were spent with farming tools in one hand and a gun slung across the back as strategic defense. Well, this goes all the way back to the days of Solomon. As he goes around the nation now of Israel, fortifying cities and building them up and strengthening the land. You know, he, was, he inherited a kingdom of peace that David fought for. And David drove back all the enemies of the Lord, and there was peace at the very end of David's life, so it's handed over to Solomon, and Solomon says, I'm going to maintain that peace. And we're going to do it through strength. We're going to build up and fortify the land. Well, he does that throughout these 13 years. The first 20 years are 20 years of building and fortification. Now, at first, Solomon appears to do the very thing that we're told to do. You may recall Jesus' words in Matthew 6.33. We've spoken them many, many times. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what does Solomon do first? He seeks the Lord. Remember last week, he went to Gibeon. He offers sacrifices there, and God meets him there. It's the first time God would meet with Solomon. And then seven years later, the completion of the temple, because Solomon is seeking first the kingdom. He completes the temple, and a second time, on the eve of that temple completion, after the dedication ceremony and the feast and festival, the Lord meets Solomon again and speaks to him. We read the Lord's response to Solomon's prayer in Second Chronicles chapter 7. When Jesus spoke these words, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. He spoke them 930 years or so after the fact. And the Jewish mind, hearing these words from Jesus, Seek first the kingdom, would have but one place to go. Back 900 years. Back to the kingdom of Solomon. The glory days. The kingdom that David won. The kingdom God promised, this was in the mind. Even today, this is in the mind of the Jewish people when they think about a kingdom. When they think about restoration of a kingdom that God promised, an eternal kingdom, that the throne of David would be an everlasting throne, they go back. Partially because after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom just goes downhill. It spirals down until finally, within 300 and some odd years, it's destroyed. And so they go back. The Jews hearing Jesus say, Seek first the kingdom, would think, Yes, the kingdom. Yes, the kingdom. The Davidic kingdom that was promised to continue. That great kingdom of Solomon, as we begin to see tonight, didn't take long to head into division and decay 
And finally, desolation and dispersion. What went wrong? What was the problem? Did Solomon not seek first the kingdom? Oh, he did. It was the first thing on his mind, the first concern. Build the temple of the Lord. And build his palace as well, but fortify, strengthen, build the kingdom, sink the kingdom. That's what he did. And yet the kingdom, by the time we get to the end tonight, is fraying. And the key, listen to me, the key is in the call of Christ to seek his kingdom. We're going to come back to that. But Solomon strengthens his kingdom. I want to give you five things he did that you may or may not want to do in your life. Five key things, we could call it the system of Solomon. This is how Solomon developed and built up his royal kingdom, his throne. And the first thing he did, as we've already talked about, he fortified his kingdom. He fortified his kingdom. Maybe you'll want to do that. Fortify your kingdom. We've all been given a little kingdom. It may be a very little kingdom the size of a bedroom, you know, if you're a teenager or whatever, but it may be a larger kingdom. You may have, you know, a gaggle of kids. James, I'm thinking of you. You've got a kingdom at home. We were, again, out with the, with the Adelots today having lunch and, and counting up and realizing that between us, we now have, how many kids was it, John? Ten between us. Between our two families. And we still don't have as many as James in the dailies. We're working on it. <laughs> but fortify your kingdom. You can do that. And look at your life, your home, your family, your job, your career. Fortify it, man. That's what Solomon was doing. Strengthening his positions. That can be a good thing depending on how you go about it. Because there is something that undermines fortification. I don't know if I've I've ever shared this before, but I was an avid cereal box reader when I was a kid. I mean, there there was nothing better than a Saturday morning with Looney Tunes cartoons and a bowl of Apple Jacks in the box right there. So it has something to do during the commercials. Very ADD. Apple Jacks, Captain Crunch, Quisp. Who remembers Quisp? Anybody? Okay. How many of you remember Quake? It was an offshoot from Quisp. And briefly, I think it lasted about a month, Quangaroos. Do you remember those cereal? Nobody but me, okay? They were orange, and it was pretty nasty. It didn't last. Anyway, there was one thing that always sat at the top of the box. And you cereal box readers may remember this. It always said, fortified with eight essential vitamins and iron. And I'd see that and go, Mom, it's fortified. You know, there could be 20 pounds of sugar in the box of cereal. But it was fortified. And the reality is, what my parents knew that I didn't understand until later... When I started realizing I passed out about 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings, was that the sugar undermined the fortification. And that's what's going on with Solomon. There is an undermining of his fortification. On the outside, it looks like, man, build the kingdom. This is what he's doing. All kinds of strong positions and bringing in and, and shoring up and strengthening his army and his might. But all the while, it is being undermined. He begins fortifying Israel in the cities of the north. As we're told, the cities that uh, Huram had given to him. Now, what cities are those? Well, you may recall the story back in 1 Kings chapter 9. It tells us King Solomon gave Hiram, or Huram, 20 cities in the land of the Galilee. So Hiram came out, came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given to him. But they did not please him. Solomon makes a gift, and Hiram looks at him and goes, Are you kidding? He said, what are these cities which you've given me, my brother? And so they were called the land of Kabul or Cable to this day. Cable. It means dirty, displeasing, good for nothing. I have, I don't know what cable you have. I've got Comcast. But it strikes me that the title works, doesn't it? Cable. Dirty, displeasing, good for nothing. I flip channel after channel after channel on cable, and that seems to be mostly what I find. Dirty, displeasing, and good for nothing. Well, that's what these cities were called. Solomon took these good-for-nothing cities back from Hiram, and he makes something of them. He begins to build. How did he do it? Verse 2 tells us, and watch this, he settled the sons of Israel there. The Jewish people have always been great settlers. If you want to have one way to ensure that a bad piece of land becomes a good piece of land, settle some Jewish people on it. Because they know how to roll back the bad. They know how to clean up the land. They truly do. The Israel that you visit today and see today is not the Israel of the late 1800s. 
that was an absolute desolation and desert mess, and the Galilee itself was nothing but boggy mosquito pits. Today it's beautiful, because the Jewish people know how to settle the land. It's really the untold story of the Jews' return in the late 19th century, early 20th century. How they went into the land, they bought it acre for acre. They have deeds to prove it. They bought it from the Arabs who were like, we don't need this land, we don't want the land. If we live there, we just get malaria anyway. So yeah, you can have it. And as the Jewish people began to buy up the land and work the land, the land began to flourish. The surrounding Arabs saw this flourishing taking place and said, we want a piece of that. We'd like to have that back now, thank you very much. A lot of the Arabs at the time, in, in good relationship with the Jewish people, began to come back just to seek jobs to work the land because suddenly the land was workable again. Well, they made something of a disregarded, unwanted land in the same way that Solomon did. These were unwanted cities, but Solomon goes up and he begins to fortify them. By the way, if you're watching what's going on in Israel right now, between the U.S. State Department and Israel, there is a big sticking point. There's a battle going on. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But it all has to do with the Jewish settlers. Verse 3. So he builds up the cities, 20 cities in the northern Galilee. Verse 3. Then Solomon went to Hamat Zobah and captured it. And I'll just point out this was the only battle on Solomon's record during his 40 years of reign until the very end. This is the only battle. Because Solomon was not a king of war. He was a king of peace. Now watch this, because while Solomon is busy fortifying Israel, like sugar in the cereal, something was undermining all of his efforts. Verse 4. He built Tadmor in the wilderness, and all the storage cities which he had built in Hamat. He also built Upper Beth Horon and Lower Beth Horon, Fortified cities with walls, gates, and bars. Why walls, gates, and bars? He's strengthening. These are cities of protection. In case of war. Building up his strength. And Baalat, verse 6. And all the storage cities that Solomon had. And all the cities for his chariots. And cities for his horsemen. And all that it pleased Solomon to build in Jerusalem. In Lebanon. And in all the land under his rule. Which was vast. So at this point, we see the problem of Solomon's fortifications. What? What what problems? Verse 5, he calls these fortified cities, cities with walls, gates, and bars. Not bars to go get drunk in, bars to keep people safe in. These fortified cities were for storage. Why? In case of war. They were for chariots. Why? So that they could ride out and fight. They were for horses and horsemen. These were largely military strength cities, military outposts, again, strategically located throughout Israel. What's the problem with that? The problem is simply that God appeared to Solomon two times in his life, as I said. At the start of his rule, and seven years later, when the temple was complete. And never again. Never again. There's not a time on record where we see the Lord appearing to Solomon after those two times. What we do see is all kinds of strategic military fortification and building, but where is the evidence of the fortification of Solomon's faith? It is lacking. He's building up his physical strength, but he's not building up his spiritual trust. And how is that not like us today? We get so into building up our lives and our physical strength and not trusting the Lord to where we trust in what we can accomplish and we trust in how we can invest and we trust in so many other things. Well, all the while the Lord is saying, how about you trust me? Let's start there. Fortify your faith. You may recall, Bible students, Deuteronomy 17, we've re- we covered this several times, that the Lord forbade His kings from amassing wealth and amassing wives and amassing horses. Why? Because it undermines the fortification of faith. The more I have, the less I think I need. In terms of wealth, the more pleasure Solomon had, which, again, I'll come back to, the more horses he had, the more strength and fighting power, and why would I need to trust the Lord when I can just fight back any enemies who might threaten me? Fortifying his own hand, his own strength, not his faith. And Isaiah would say in Isaiah 30, verse 15, 
He prophesied. The Lord said, the Holy One of Israel, in repentance and rest, you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing, Israel. You said, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, you will flee. And all of Isaiah 30 is, is a, it's a condemnation of the Lord on Solomon, saying, you went out, not just Solomon, the king and all of Israel, you went out after these horses of Egypt. You brought all the horses of Egypt in. You built up your chariot cities. You built up your horses. And that's where your strength and your trust is. And yet, if you would just be quiet and still and rest before me, you would find your strength. Gang, Solomon didn't just love horses because he was a horse lover. He loved horses because they represented power. Because the more he had, the stronger his army. He loved peace, and he wanted to protect it. So he fortifies Israel with horses and chariots, and horse cities and chariot cities, instead of fortifying his faith. Psalm 91, verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Did you hear that? My fortress, my God in whom I trust. What are your fortifications? What are you busy fortifying in your life? I encourage you, brothers and sisters, fortify your faith. You see, because our most practical plans to fortify our lives can actually undermine the very thing we need. And I'll give you an example. Coming back to the U.S. State Department in Israel right now, U.S. policy is stop Israeli settlement activities. The U.S. is putting incredible pressure right now on Israel to stop all settling. On the West Bank, there are 600,000 Jewish people who live on the West Bank. What are you going to do with them? Stop all settlement activity in East Jerusalem. Well, that happens to be the place of the Temple Mount, the holiest site in all Israel for all the Jewish people in the world. Stop building there. The U.S. is saying you've got to stop all this settling activity. And I've told you before, I fear that if our policy continues down this road, that the fortification we're looking for, and you've got to think politically here for just a moment, we look to Arab fortification right now. What do you mean? Appease the Arab people. Appease those who are upset with Israel. Appease the Palestinians. Appease the Jordanians, the Syrians, the Lebanese, specifically the Hamas and the Hezbollah terrorists. Appease them. Give up land. Stop settling. Appease, appease, appease. And we are undermining where the strength of America, at least some of it, comes from. And that is in our trust in the Lord. Well, you can fortify your cities. Secondly, you can enlist your enemies. Solomon did. What? Look at verse 7. All of the people who were left of the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Megabytes, flashlights, you know, (laughs) who were not of Israel, namely from their descendants, who were left after them in the land, whom the sons of Israel had not destroyed, you might underline that, whom the sons of Israel had not destroyed, then Solomon raised his forced laborers to this day. But Solomon did not make slaves for his work for the sons of Israel. They were men of war. Why do you need men of war if you're a king of peace? His chief captains and commanders of his chariots and his horsemen. These were the chief officers of King Solomon. 250 who ruled over the people. Gang the ites. Jebusites and the Hivites and the Canaanites. All of the ites were supposed to have been wiped out when Solomon and the people came into the land some 400 years earlier. You remember that? The Lord was unequivocal. Deuteronomy chapter 20 verse 17. You shall utterly destroy them. The Hittite, Amorite, Canaanite, Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite, as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that they may not teach you to do according to all their detestable things which they have done for their gods. Detestable things like what? Child sacrifice. Sexual perversion. These people were so sick, it was like a dog with rabies, I've said before. Shoot the dog. Put it out of its misery. And the Lord says... So that you would not sin against the Lord your God. They were told clearly, when you go into the land to drive them out. Well, here, they are, here we are in Solomon's rule and Solomon's reign. And the ites are still there. Let me ask you this question. Do you think God's position had changed? 
You think across 400 years, he went, maybe that was a little harsh of me. Maybe we ought to back off and reconsider this a little bit, and maybe we should appease the ites. Or, better yet, Solomon put them to work. This is not of the Lord, gang. He didn't tell Solomon to put these guys to work. Solomon put them to work. He hired them. He managed them. Thinking, I'm sure I can control these pagans. Just put them to work. Have them serve us. I understand they still have their idol worship and all that, but I can utilize the manpower and manage these people with a set of my own leaders. And when we do the same thing, it's dangerous, gang. It's dangerous in our lives when we think we can manage the enemy. I can manage these sins. Uh, They're not big. They're just occasional. They're like the little foxes in the vineyard. They're like the little foxes. I did Eva and Zach's wedding, and they're here. How's it going? Still good? All right, good. Uh, Last Saturday... So they're not even a a full week married. And by the way, can you give them a congratulation on their new marriage? But this this verse stuck in my head, and we talked about this, a husband and a wife, and and in uh, the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 15, the bride is talking to her beloved, and she says, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that are ruining the vineyards, while our vineyards are in blossom. You remember what I talked about there? I don't know if you do, because, you know, when you're getting married, you're kind of just like... As soon as you shut up, we can get out of here and be happy, you know, please. But we talked about how most marriages don't fail because of catastrophe. Most marriages fail because of the little foxes that get into the vineyard. They don't seem to be like a big deal. It's just a little financial problem here. It's just a little sexual problem there. It's just a little, you know, uh, in-law problem over here. And suddenly, and by the way, those are the top three reasons why there are problems in marriage. But it's the little things that they get in. It's the little foxes in the vineyard. And that's what we're talking about here. It's the little enemies that we think it's not a big deal. For Solomon, it's the wisdom of compromise. I will compromise here. Better to have little foxes close where I can keep an eye on them rather than drive them out. It's one hand to the Lord and it's another hand to the world. And it doesn't work. It never works. We need to lift both hands to the Lord. Well, it doesn't stop there. Now, you might say, well, Rick, wait a minute. Isn't compromise a good thing? Not when it comes to the Word of God. We can compromise in other areas of our life, but when God says this is the way it needs to be and this is my Word on the matter, and we compromise that, it's like closing our eyes to the foxes destroying the vineyard. Solomon enlisted his enemies and he fortified his cities with military might. Number three, (laughs) make provision for the flesh. You don't have to do this. Not encouraging you to, but this is what Solomon did. Allow yourself just a little pleasure on the side. Look at verse 11. Then Solomon brought Pharaoh's daughter up from the city of David to the house which he had built for her. For he said, uh, My wife shall not dwell in the house of David, king of Israel, because the places are holy where the ark of the Lord has entered. What? Now, if you were Solomon's wife, that would be a slap in the face. Sorry, you can't live here, hon, because this is a holy place. So I need to put you somewhere not holy. I need to keep you over off on the side. You really shouldn't be here. This whole idea, Solomon married a daughter of Egypt, Pharaoh's daughter, and brings her into his house and even recognizes, as we see in this verse, that she can't live near the temple. She can't be there. So I've got to keep her over here somewhere else. The, whole, the temple's holy. She's not So what does he do? He builds her a little cottage cottage on the side. I I like this. I put it this way. He has his holy place in the city and his hottie in the country. Okay? This is what he set up. I'll go here to pray and I'll go there to play. And he had both going on. Some commentators try to clean this up and they say that Solomon was just doing what was common custom in the day. What the kings would do, they would forge alliances of peace with other nations by marrying the daughter of the other king and bringing her into his house, and this is how they had peace. Okay, if that was the case, were there 700 nations round about? I mean, how many wives did he have? And this couldn't all have been about politics. It wasn't politics. It was pleasure. Romans 13, verse 11. Paul writes, it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. 
For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And let's behave properly as in the day, not carousing and in drunkenness, and not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and listen, make no provision for the flesh. Don't build a little cottage for the sin. Don't tuck it away at somewhere you'll visit on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Of course, you'll come into the city for worship on Sunday. Don't make any provision for the flesh. And Solomon did. And he made provision for his enemies. He gave them jobs. And he provided for his own strength in fortified cities. But at least, you might say, he maintained the temple and all of its holy requirements. And he went to worship, right? Watch this, verse 12. Then Solomon offered burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch. And he did so according to the daily rule, offering them up according to the commandment of Moses for the Sabbaths. And the new moons and the three annual feasts, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, which is Pentecost, by the way, and the Feast of Booths. Now, according to the ordinance of his father, David, he appointed the divisions of the priests for their service and the Levites for their duties of praise and ministering before the priests, according to the daily rule and the gatekeepers by their divisions at every gate. For David, the man of God, had so commanded. Verse 15. And they did not depart from the commandment of the king to the priests and the Levites in any manner or concerning the storehouses. Thus all the work of Solomon was carried out from the day of the foundation of the house of the Lord until it was finished. So the house of the Lord was completed. Number four. And you can do this. Solomon did. Keep the daily rule. Keep the daily rule. While many of his other choices were eroding the kingdom from within, this may be the most insidious thing of all. Now watch this, because it may be a different way of looking at these few verses. You look at the verses and go, okay, he's doing all these other terrible things. Man, he's still going to worship. At least he's still going to church. This is what I would call cultural Christianity. You're showing up. You're following the daily rule. The daily offerings, gang, they don't take any faith. Now, I'm not saying people didn't have faith who made the offerings, but you can make the offerings without any faith at all. You can show up at church on a Sunday without any faith at all. You can take communion and not be showing faith. Not have it in your heart. You can bow your head and not have any faith in what's being prayed. Church going requires no relationship. Keeping the daily rule is not proof of what's happening in the heart. But hold on to that thought for a moment. We're on the verge of discovering the key, I believe, to the downfall of the entire kingdom. Read on a little further, verse 17. Then Solomon went to Etzion Geber and to Elot on the seashore in the land of Edom. And Huram, by his servants, sent him ships and servants who knew the sea. And they went with Solomon's servants to Ophir. And they took from there 450 talents of gold and brought them to King Solomon. Where is Ophir? India. This will be a three-year journey by ship from Israel around the coast down and around and up to India. And the sons of Israel were not seafaring people. They were seafaring people. As we see with the men in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, and by the way... The reason why they were on the boat fishing on the Sea of Galilee is it's not really a sea, it's a lake. It's a freshwater lake. They were not seafaring people, the sons of Israel. They were farmers. And so Hiram and Solomon, they kind of make a pact and say, let's get together here. You got the ships, you got the captains and the know-how. I got servants, I'll put them on the ships. You know, they'll be seasick for a few days, but you know, after three years, they'll get it. And we'll sail around together and we'll make some great commercial transactions and we will build up our gold and our wealth. Solomon still amassing wealth, one of the three key things he was not to do. What's the problem with this? Number five, and you can do this if you want to, partner with unbelievers. Partner with unbelievers. But understand this, gang, the true riches of the kingdom are not bought financially, they're fought for faithfully. They're not bought financially. They're fought for faithfully. Notice Solomon brings in 450 talents of gold by this terrific venture. Three years there, three years back. So a minimum of six years. 
And after six years bringing in this gold, 15.75 tons of gold that they brought out of Ophir. And he did it through commercial compromise. It was business. And you would think, good business, and yet... Paul writes this, 2 Corinthians 6.14, Do not be bound together with unbelievers. We use that as a marriage passage, and yet, it goes across the board, gang. If you're going to enter into business with someone, I encourage you, enter in with a believer. Know what you're getting involved with. I watched a friend of mine enter into business with an unbeliever, and he became very much like an unbeliever. Because of the things he had to do to stay in that partnership. Six years, and he brought back 450 talents of gold, 15 tons or so. David brought in over 100,000 talents of gold, and he wasn't even looking for it. He wasn't even going after it. He wasn't on commercial ventures. He was on committed conquest. He was fighting as led by the Lord and pushing back the nations and securing Israel. It wasn't business for David. No, it was faithfulness. 100,000 talents of gold, by the way, compared to Solomon's 15 tons, that's 3,750 tons that came in when David was just following the Lord. You see, you see first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 6.12, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And I would hope that if you partner with a believer, that's what it's about. Even a commercial business venture will be first and foremost about seeking the kingdom and fighting the good fight of faith, not about what you can get. God's going to provide that. And He's going to bless if you're seeking first the kingdom. David wasn't seeking riches. He was seeking the kingdom. And the Lord added to him, the riches. Which brings us to the key of the kingdom's failure. And I just saw this for the first time yesterday. Watch this. Jesus said, going back, Matthew 6, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. A lot of people are seeking the kingdom. But if you're not seeking the righteousness as well, it's not going to get you anywhere. Please understand me on this. You can be seeking the kingdom, but leave out the righteousness and you can lose the whole thing. What David had, Solomon lacked, and that was faith unto righteousness. You might notice back in verse 14 that David is called the man of God. In other places, David is called a man after God's own heart. Solomon is never once called that. Solomon's never once called a man of God. What's the big difference? David sought the kingdom and his righteousness. Solomon sought the kingdom. But the righteousness is void and missing. And if we seek the kingdom, even gain the kingdom of God, if we seek it without seeking His righteousness, our fortifications will fail and our faith will eventually crumble. And you might ask, okay, well, let's get, let's get practical here, Rick. How do I seek the kingdom and His righteousness? How do we get this spiritualized, kind of esoteric concept down into the reality of the day today? How do I seek His righteousness? I'll show you. Turn over to the book of Romans, chapter 3. Keep your finger there in Second Chronicles. Romans, chapter 3. And this is how you seek His righteousness in addition to the kingdom. Romans, chapter 3, verse 21. Paul writes, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, remember we're seeking his righteousness, the righteousness of God has been manifested or made known to us, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. That's how you seek his righteousness. Faith in Jesus. If you are deepening and seeking to deepen your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness will be sought. You will be seeking His righteousness. You can't have one without the other. You cannot seek Jesus without seeking His righteousness. And Paul says, there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. That's why we talk about Jesus so much here. That's why you will not come in to this fellowship and hear any teaching that does not ultimately end up at or with Jesus. Because without Jesus, we're seeking the kingdom without the righteousness. We have to have Jesus. 
for the righteousness to work. Skip on down to chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. There's so much great theology here. We'll get to it someday. But Romans 4 verse 13. Paul explains a little more about this whole idea of the righteousness of God. He says, The promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there's no law, there's also no violation. What does that mean? It means if you're not under law, you can't violate the law. Guess what? If your faith is in Jesus Christ, you are not under law, you're under grace. Therefore, the law has no hold on you. All of God's perfect righteous requirements are fulfilled in Jesus, and I live under grace. So even though I know I can't keep those requirements, He did. And my faith in Him is now my righteousness. Read a little bit further. I love this. He says in verse 16, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Faith is the deal. And faith is not a spiritualized, vague thing. Teenagers, listen to me. Faith is getting to know Jesus. Faith is determining to love Him more. To spend more time with Him. To know how He thinks. And and even as we sang, oh, tonight, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. That is faith-expanding stuff. And as your faith expands, so the righteousness of God expands in your life. And anybody can do it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to develop a deeper faith. You just kneel and pray. And your faith grows. You open up His Word and read. You may not understand all of it, but you read anyway. And your faith expands. And you meditate. Maybe you find a single verse that just means so much to you and you read it over and over and you meditate and think about it. Say, God, would you implant this in my heart? And your faith is growing now. And along with it, you are seeking not just the kingdom, but the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we sang it tonight. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Gang, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And like David, all these things, they'll be added unto you as well. Well, chapter 9, verse 1 tells us when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon... She came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with very, uh, with difficult questions. She had a very large retinue with camels carrying spices and a large amount of gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was on her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from Solomon which he did not explain to her. So we see the wisdom of God at work here. When the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon... The house which he had built, the food at his table, which was mammoth, by the way, the seating of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their attire, that is how they were dressed even, his cupbearers, and their attire, and his stairway, by which he went up to the house of the Lord, she was breathless. This queen, and by the way, she was a very famous queen among the Arabic people, even to this day a well-known famous queen, this queen of, of Sheba or Seba, and she comes up and she is blown away by what she sees in Solomon. And then she said to the king, it is a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe their reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told to me. You surpassed the report that I heard. How blessed are your men. How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne as a king for the Lord your God. Because your God loved Israel, establishing them forever. Therefore he made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. Though we know that now looking back, that righteousness part was failing. She saw all this and said it must be going on. There must be righteousness here. And then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great amount of spices and precious stones. 
There had never been spice like that which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Well, the servants of Hiram and the servants of Solomon who brought gold from Ophir also brought algum trees and precious stones. And from the algum trees, the king made steps for the house of the Lord and for the king's palace and lyres and harps for the singers. And none like that was seen before in the land of Judah. This would be like a tailored guitar for me. And it's, wow. Okay. Verse 12. King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire which she requested besides a return for what she had brought to the king. And then she returned and went to her own land with her servants after having a child with Solomon. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's not in scripture. I just say that because that's part of you know, some of the false tradition that's floating around out there that the two of them had a child together and, and as a gift to the child Solomon decided to give the Ark of the Covenant and it made its way down to Ethiopia <laughs> we'll come back to that actually we're going to talk about this more on, on Sunday but I want you to think about this the journey from Sheba or Seba was at a minimum 1500 miles which by camelback is 75 days. Do you remember riding camels, Spencer, in Israel? Can you imagine a 75-day ride? No, no. 75 minutes, and I would have been a dead man. Okay? It's not an easy ride. 75 days just to get up there. But for this queen, the journey was worth it. She was absolutely amazed to the point that you could even make the case that she got saved. That she became a believer. That she actually, in some tradition, holds that she became... Jewish, a proselyte Jew, because of the wonders and splendor that she saw that she believed could only be God. And Jesus said this about her, and I think it's interesting, Matthew 12, 42. If you take this literally, he said, the queen of the south, that's the queen of Sheba, will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, Jesus says, something greater than Solomon is here. We're going to talk about the greater than Solomon on Sunday. But as for Solomon, his wealth, it just continued on the increase. Verse 13 going on tells us now the weight of the gold which came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents. Besides that which the traders and the merchants bought, brought in all the kings of Arabia and the governors of the country brought gold and silver to Solomon. It's getting thick here, gang. King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of beaten gold on each large shield. You can look up shekels, figure out how much that is. He made 300 shields of beaten gold, using 300 shekels of gold on each shield, and the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Now, this is his his palatial house up in Lebanon, so he had all these shields of gold there. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory (laughs) and overlaid it with pure gold. Now, I would think an ivory throne itself would be pretty impressive. But apparently, they finished the ivory throne, and Solomon went... You know, if we just covered it with gold, it'd be perfect. You know, it'd be really, really nice to look at then. There were six steps to the throne and a footstool on, in gold attached to the throne and arms on each side of the seat and two lions standing besides the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. This is an impressive throne. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. Silver was not considered even valuable in the days of King Solomon. Oh, you got silver? Whatever. Yeah, let's go for the gold. For the king had ships which went to Tarshish with the servants of Hiram. Once every three years to the, the, the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver and ivory and apes and peacocks. If you're into those things. These are all symbols of wealth. Great, vast symbols of wealth. King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. And all the kings of the earth were seeking the presence of Solomon to hear the wisdom which God had put in his heart. Politically, worldwide, Solomon was more popular than Clinton was. It's just incredible. They brought every man his gifts, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses and mules, so much year by year. Now, reading on, just watch this. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And he stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And he was ruler over all the kings from the Euphrates River 
even to the land of the Philistines. That would be from basically from Iraq to Gaza. That whole area was under his rule as far as the border of Egypt. The king made silver as common as stones in Jerusalem. And he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. And they were bringing horses for Solomon from Egypt and from all countries. Now the rest of the acts of Solomon from first to last. Are they not written in the records of Nathan the prophet and in the prophecy of Ahijah the Shilonite and in the visions of Edo the seer concerning Jeroboam the son of Nebat? Solomon reigned 40 years in Jerusalem over all Israel. And Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David. And his son Rehoboam reigned in his place. Gang, when it was all said and done, Solomon was the richest king to have ever lived to that point, to that date. He multiplied his wealth. He multiplied his women. He multiplied his horses. He multiplied, but he did not count the cost. He did not look to that little place after the equal sign to see what it all truly added up to. What was the cost of his multiplication? Two things we can note. First off, he may have forfeited his soul. He may have forfeited his soul. In Ecclesiastes, as an old man, Solomon chapter 12 verse 5 said, For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. And for all that we just read, this amazing wealth and riches unsurpassed, here's Solomon at the end going, it's worthless. It's cabal. It's worth nothing to me. It got me nowhere. We know that Solomon at the end of his life, we're told in in the book of the Kings that he turned away from the Lord. His heart turned after the foreign idols that all of his wives brought into his house. He may have forfeited his soul. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 26, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And I've said before, we cannot know for sure if we will even see great King Solomon in heaven. He may not be there. On the other hand, he might. (laughs) Which goes to the mercy and grace of God. There is a hint that he might. For here at the very end of his life, as he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, he doesn't call himself the king. He doesn't call himself the grand lord of the kingdom of Israel. He doesn't even call himself the great son of David. He calls himself the preacher. In Ecclesiastes 12 verse 10 tells us the preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. The conclusion when all has been heard fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person so Solomon may have come around and it certainly aligns with God's mercy but even if he didn't lose his own soul he certainly forfeited the kingdom 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 9 tells us the Lord was angry with Solomon Because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Remember the beginning of his reign, seven years later, and not again. And it commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this. Oh, so he does meet with him again, doesn't he? Here at the end. Because you have done this, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you. I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and I will give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father, David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant, David, for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And the rest of 
1 Kings 11 there describes adversaries that God begins to raise up against peaceful King Solomon. Men of war who would come at him. A man by the name of Rezin who came out of Syria. And Hadad the Edomite. And another man by the name of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Interesting young man. But following Solomon's death, the kingdom he worked so hard to build up and fortify and protect, it began to fall apart. 2 Chronicles chapter 10. Then Rehoboam went to Shechem. For all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. When Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, and you can read about that story back in 1st, uh, 1st, 2nd Kings. Jeroboam returned from Egypt. So they sent and they summoned him. And when Jeroboam and all Israel came, they spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard. Now therefore lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. And so he said to them, Return to me again in three days. So the people, they departed. Rehoboam comes along. He makes a great start. Uh, He goes to Shechem. Shechem historically is an important landmark in Israel. Abraham built his first altar there. And there in Shechem, Jacob bought land. And Moses stood at Shechem. In fact, the city of Shechem, if you look on a map, stands right between two mountains. Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, which are the Mount of Curse and the Mount of Blessings. You may recall Moses stood in the middle of that. And the people stood on one mountain or the other. And he called out curses and they would respond, Amen. And he called out blessings and they would respond, Amen. Well, it was at Shechem, the significant place. Joseph was buried at Shechem. It had great historic significance. And so for Rehoboam, as we see in verse 1, to go to Shechem at the beginning, that was a wise political move. But it was also located there in the tribe of Manasseh, who with Ephraim considered themselves to be leaders of the northern ten tribes. So he goes there to meet with the people. He was a smart guy, but sadly he made some stupid moves. Commentator Alex McLaren said, His is a miserable story of imbecility and arrogance. How'd you like that to be your epitaph? Rehoboam, an imbecile and an arrogant man. Why so? We'll read on. He made three big blunders. Verse 6. King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive, saying, How do you counsel me that that I should answer the people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you will be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. First big blunder. Rehoboam's ears were tuned to the wrong frequency. Now, oftentimes this passage is made to point out, if you will listen to the wiser, older people instead of the younger people, you'd be smart to do so. The problem is Rehoboam does not go to the Lord. His first choice is to go to man for consultation. His ears were tuned to humanity and not to divinity, and that's a problem. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13 says, Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or has his counselor has informed him? With whom does God consult, and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him in the way of understanding? The implication, guys, is God has all the answers. Why not go to him first? Why not start with the Lord, consult there, And then if you want to ask other people their opinions, other believers, great, go for it. Start with the Lord. Rehoboam didn't. His first blunder is he tuned into the wrong frequency. His second blunder is his heart was turned to the wrong relevancy. Rehoboam's heart was turned to the wrong relevancy. Verse 8 tells us he forsook the counsel of the elders, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and, and served him. So he said to them, what counsel do you give that we may answer the people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? And the young men who grew up with him, they spoke to him, saying, thus you shall say to the people who spoke to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter for us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. (laughs) Amazing. I'll explain that one in just a moment. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, I will discipline you with scorpions. And this is the advice of the young men. Rehoboam's heart was tuned or turned to the wrong relevancy. What do you mean by that? I mean, he went for the young advice. Rehoboam at this point is 41 years old, so he's not exactly a kid, but he hears the voice of youth. He hears the voice of the young men, and he thinks, these guys are cool. 
you know, with their tattoos and their piercings, I can hang with them. And so this is the generation that knows what's up. So I'm going to listen to this generation. Because they're relevant, and they're hip, and they're with it, and they know what's going on. Gang, can I just encourage you, don't go looking back. Teenagers, one more thing for you tonight, specifically. Don't go looking for the latest. Go looking for the Lord. Don't go looking for what seems hip and happening, and you're going to be tempted with that in the church itself. You're going to get to the point, some of you may have graduated out of high school, I don't know where you all are at. You may head on into college, you may be of that age, and you may be looking around, and I'll tell you, the lure is to you. Even in the church, oh, the old people don't have a clue what they're doing. Let's do this new thing. Let me encourage you, don't listen to the old people or the young people. Go to the Lord and do what He says. By the way, how old is Jesus? By all estimates, uh, eternally, you know. But if we're just going to count Him from His birth, He'd be over 2,000 years old and He is still relevant. The Bible tells us, remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, Hebrews 13, and consider the result of their conduct. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. And there are plenty of them out there. And they are veiled in relevance. Well, this is what the church can do now. This is the church of the future. This is the church of, of, of really, now, we're different than the previous generation. You know, so Bible study, that's kind of passe. And, you know, the worship stuff and the prayer groups, that, that's passe. We want experience. Be careful. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings. Rehoboam sought the young vote. And it was a blunder. Every generation thinks they have the newest, best way to God. And every generation misses the fact that Jesus is the only way to the Father. A third blunder of Rehoboam, quickly here, his fingers took hold of the wrong authority. His fingers took hold of the wrong authority. I told you I'd explain verse 10. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. The loins would be literally the waistline. Solomon would have had a rather large waistline. How do you know that? Because I know what was on his table every day. 1 Kings 4.22 says, Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour. 30 cores is 11,000 pounds of flour daily. 60 cores, that's 18,750 pounds of meal. That is a lot of Apple Jacks. Ten fat oxen, twenty pasture-fed oxen. So you get the fat ones and the lean ones. You know the good meat and the fat, which you know the tasty, greasy stuff. And a hundred sheep, besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fat and fowl, every day. That's a big grocery list. Huge. Rehoboam is saying, Israel, if you think my dad's yoke was heavy, <laughs> the yoke's on you. Literally, is what he's saying. It's going to get heavier. Verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed, saying, Return to me on the third day. So the king answered them harshly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the elders. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy. I will add to it. I'm the boss here. This is the arrogance coming out. Stupid arrogance. I will make it heavier. He says, my father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. And he's not talking about the insect. He's talking about the equivalent. The scorpion in that day was the nickname that they had for the same thing in Jesus' day that was called the flagellum or the cat of nine tails. It was a whip with chunks of metal in it. So you think my father disciplined you with whips? I'm using scorpions. I'm using a flagellum. It's going to get hard and heavy and difficult for you. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of events from God that the Lord might establish his word that he spoke through Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. What's going on here? This bad political move. Solomon's taxation was great. It had to be, because the kingdom took a lot to run. It had to be a heavy taxation to run a glorious kingdom. But Solomon had royal credibility. Solomon had the right to stand up before the people and say, we're going to have to turn up the taxes again this year. Well, why did he have the right? Because he had clout. He was heir to his father's throne. He was in the direct line. He was the son of David. Now, yeah, Rehoboam was in the line, but Solomon was David's own son, anointed by David himself. Solomon was the builder of the temple. He was world-renowned and popular among all the nations. 
And he was promised an eternal kingdom. So Solomon had authority and could tax heavily to get the job done. Rehoboam's a day late and a dollar short. He has none of his father's credibility. He hasn't done anything for Israel. He has not proven himself as a leader. But he thinks that he gets the authority because he happens to be Solomon's son. And he's dead wrong. Rehoboam sought a kingdom, but did not seek the righteousness of God. That's his biggest mistake. Same as his father. Can I just point out that when it comes to Jesus, you can't earn it either. I'm talking about authority. Do you realize that you and I have no spiritual authority in and of ourselves? The only authority that we truly have is the declaration of the name of Jesus Christ, who is our authority. Who said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18. Daniel wrote in Daniel 7, 14, to him was given dominion, glory, a kingdom that all the people's nations and language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And so you and I have a claim to authority, not, not to David, not to Solomon, but to Jesus. Which again, let me drive this point home, is why we seek His righteousness and His kingdom. Because the power is in His righteousness and not ours. We have not earned it any more than Rehoboam earned the right to call himself a harsh king. And speaking of authority, this whole event played out exactly as God planned it would. As we see in verse 15 there, it was a turn of events for God so the Lord might establish His word. He said this would happen. I'm going to tear the kingdom away from His son, Solomon's son. And that's exactly what we see take place. You can read the prophecy that was given about this in 1 Kings 11, 29 through 35. Verse 16. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. And all Israel departed to their tents. But as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, that is the people of the northern ten tribes who lived down in the cities of Judah and in Jerusalem, King Rehoboam reigned over them. And then King Rehoboam... (laughs) the final stupid thing he does he sends Hadoram who is over the forced labor or literally the tax collector he goes ahead and even though the people take off say we're not going to have anything to do with you he sends his tax collector to go ahead and start receiving the heavier taxes well the sons of Israel stoned him to death you ever want to stone a tax I won't go there (laughs) and King Rehoboam (laughs) made haste to mount his chariot and flee to Jerusalem Verse 19, and it's one of the most tragic verses of Scripture. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That is to the day of the writing of Second Chronicles, which was down in 400. Rebellion. Division. We now get... I, I'm, I went through chapter 10 because I wanted you to see the full picture. We see Solomon begin in glory. He builds the temple. He fortifies it. does all these great things. And here we see his true legacy, a divided kingdom. The legacy of David was a kingdom of peace that he hands over. The legacy of Solomon is a divided, destroyed kingdom. He worked awfully hard to fortify it. And in fact, if it had been an enemy trying to fight its way in from the outside, it wouldn't have worked. Because there was strong physical fortification. But there was no spiritual fortification. And the faith was weak. And so the decay comes from the inside. And the kingdom divides And it's lost. It's a dark day in Israel's history. In fact, so dark, Isaiah said in Isaiah 7, 17, he said, The Lord will bring on you and your people and on your father's house such days as have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah. Now, he's talking about the Assyrian attack when he says that, but he compares it to this day, the division. Considered the darkest day, the worst day in Israel so far. But I want to point one last thing out to you here. Isaiah 7.17 talks about that horrible day. But it's mentioned in conjunction with one of the key messianic prophecies in all of Scripture, Isaiah 7.14, which reads, The Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Prophecy of Jesus. And I point this out, gang, because we see a lot of division in the world, even in the church, don't we? 
difference. A lot of denominations, a lot of different opinions, a lot of rebelling, a, a divided house sometimes it seems. But even as men divide, God has already moved to unite. He has already promised not only to unite, reunite Judah and Israel together as one. In Ezekiel's prophecy of the two sticks, I don't have time for it. Ezekiel 37, you can read that. But even greater, Jesus Christ unites in a way that no man can or will. Paul said in Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free man, male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. So though we end here with a divided Israel before we come back next week, we know that the great unity under Jesus Christ is coming. It will happen. There's coming a day when the kingdom will be unified and glorious because of the righteousness of Jesus. Seek the kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Last verse, Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land, in his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is his name by which he will be called. It's a new name that will be given to Jesus, the Lord our righteousness. Seek the kingdom, seek his righteousness. And Father, we do so tonight. We pray by faith that our faith would increase. And we know and we believe, even declare tonight, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know it is by grace we are saved through faith. And we recognize and praise you, Lord, we praise you that this is the righteousness of God, our faith in Jesus. And so even tonight as we go home, Lord, send us home with a sense of your righteousness and your goodness over us all. And we thank you for your words and for your time with us tonight. Holy Spirit, stay with us. In Jesus' name, amen.